Hello and welcome to today's Battle Mech Review. We are continuing a, a group of mechs here that were originally featured in Comstar's TRO 3050, some, what some people call the uh, early clan invasion mechs. A lot of those are, well, quite popular at that time and ever since. Uh, some less so, like this one here, the Elbringer, which has a, a rather terrible reputation as a glass cannon. And I'm not going to deny it. It is a very odd machine. It's got the armor of a medium mech on an heavy mech and uh, the firepower of an assault mech on top of it. So it does one thing really well, and that's bring a whole lot of guns to the show. Here we've got one unusual body kit that you might see every once in a while. This is a more recent one from Clan Els Ors. It's simplified over the original, but the chassis underneath is the same thing. It's just the body kits that different. And on the other side here, we've got a, a Solaris version of the Hellbringer uh, with a retractable blade. This is not a standard configuration, but uh, it worked very well in the arena when it was being used. Especially since the Hellbringer is literally that. It's a mech meant to be used in duels and uh, short fights. So let's get into it. The Elbringer is one of those odd machines which came out in the early 30th century, basically in between the first and the second generation of Omnimex. Omni technology at that point was more or less standard. You were getting some of those second generation machines taking the field. And, uh, well, things got pretty bad for Clan Elsors when the Ghost Bear decided to take Tokasha which was where they had a majority of their factories. The horses got beat up really bad, and it really forced them to start building all sorts of new mach machines to compensate. From historical records I was able to grab, the horses had built a whole bunch of brand new Omnimech designs, and all of them were abject failure except for the Hellbringer. Think about that for a second, okay? Uh, the Elbringer was the successful one of the bunch. Uh, that was a pretty darn scary if you think about it. The Omnimex you were seeing a lot at that point, you were uh, getting all those first generation Omnimex, those transitional mechs like the Night Chanter and the Spirit Walker. There was one called the Warlock, which I really don't know much about. We actually don't have any records of that one. But... They basically went with, let's make a fairly simple machine that is going to take the best parts of various other machines and uh, make it as simple as possible to repair, to source, and to uh, field. So the Elbringer basically uh, mixes up the summoner, mainly the leg assembly of it. It's scaled down by just a little bit, but it's the same kind of leg assembly that you have on uh, the summoner with ideas from things like the Warhammer and the Thunderbolt, both of which are classic and standard mechs that our friends in the uh, Els Ors would have known of and probably upgraded uh, quite a few o of over the years. Surprisingly, the Els Ors managed to sell the darn thing to just about everyone, it, not just getting trialed to uh, have the rights to build it. No, they, they were selling it to just about everybody. So much so that it was included in Technical Readout 3050 as the de facto 65-ton mech of the clan invasion. Uh, at the time of the invasion, the Jade Falcon were the primary operator of the machine, and it was common in their Toman at all times. You pretty much add one in every single star, or so I've heard. And the fact that most configurations were utterly mad uh, led to the nickname Loki by the Inner Sphere forces and Galen Cox, who's the one who actually... Uh, coined the name. At 65 ton, the Elbringers is built to bring a quick lightning warfare like the clans want war to actually be, and not how war actually is once it starts. It only has a meager 8 tons of standard plates, it's not even ferrofibrous, so it's barely better armored than most medium mechs, and by that I mean succession war era medium mech. It basically has the same armor as a Withworth. It uses a basic chassis as well, no endo steel on there, so that does make it remarkably easy to build and maintain, which is a big plus in a way. 
The difficult bit in there is the 325 XL engine, which gives it a top speed of 86 kilometers per hour with 13 double heat sinks built in, which might be a little bit harder to source. You will need some fancier material and some decent, decent material science in order to build it. But it's not the end of the world. It's not something that you're going to have uh, that big of an issue reproducing. What it gives you is a lot of internal room to play with because you don't have any of the extra bits and bobs from the endosteel or the ferrofibrous. And you still get a very decent 28 and a half tons of pod space to play with. When talking about a utterly mad configuration, it's basically because all the basic configuration used by the Elbringer during the invasion really didn't seem to have a clear focus. The primary configuration packs a whole lot of punch with a pair of ERPPC in each arm. You barely have enough heat sinks to be able to shoot both, but you know, you've got them. To back this up at closer range, but not that much since plan ER medium lasers have a very good range, well, you've got three of them. So if you start shooting uh, the two ERPPCs and the three uh, ER medium lasers, you're either going to boil yourself to death or uh, blow up the ammo for that Streak 6 tube SRM or the pair of ammo, dependent machine guns, or those anti-personal pods that you've got in your legs as well. Because yes, the Elbringer brings all sorts of gadgets to the field, including anti-personal pods, which are terrible. There's no good reason anybody should ever use those. It, literally take them off the legs, replace them by two double heat sinks, and you've just improved the Elbringer by a uh, big margin. But outside of that, you have a targeting computer, an active probe, an ECM, and an anti-missile system. This is basically an electronic warfare machine with huge guns and definitely not enough armor. Is that a bad thing? Well, yes, you just don't have enough armor to be able to stay in the field and serve as an electronic warfare machine. With slight modification and, you know, just a few tweaks, it's probably going to be quite a bit superior, at least in terms of lasting power in the field, as long as you don't get shot at too much. There were two other standard configurations which were fairly common during Operation Revival. Alpha kept the machine gun and the active probe as well as one of the ER medium lasers of the Prime. The rest is, uh, well, still utterly mad. You have a 20 rack LRM on the shoulder with a NARC missile beacon in order to help everybody with their own missiles if necessary. For your main guns, well, you have a pair of ER large lasers, which are very good. Clan ER large lasers will give you a, a very good bang for your buck. And an ultra five class auto cannon with uh, barely enough ammos to make it count. Is it bad? Well, it's an Elbringer. That's basically what you got to think about. Move some parts around, move some pods around. It might be better than what you see here. Let's talk about site design here, even though it's not the invasion design that we were talking about here. Uh, this is probably the best place to talk about it because uh, hotel configuration is roughly put a retread of that alpha. Uh, you still have the Ultra AC5. The large lasers are replaced with an ERPPC. You get some defensive equipment with machine guns and an anti-missile pod. The missile rack is downgraded to a 15 rack which is not a terrible thing, while you also get an heavy large laser and four heavy small laser for eye damage at shorter range. The heavy small lasers range is rather terrible, but they do pack quite a bit of punch. Heavy large lasers are probably one of the most devastating weapon you can have on a mech to this day, even though their heat curve is uh, really something to worry about. Bravo configuration goes for a sniper slash brawler at the same time kind of configuration with not enough armor or mobility to actually do either. Uh, each arm mounts a sniper gun, a big one and a tiny one, a Gauss rifle and an LB5X with a meager one ton of reload for each of them. So that means that you have to choose between slugs or clusters for your LBs. You then get a pair of uh, six tube SRM that are Artemis enhanced, so you'll get very good accuracy on them when you shoot at their shorter range. Uh, you even get that small emotional support ER small laser in that little trap door on the side where the uh, ER medium lasers go normally on the prime. Uh, it's cute, it's not super useful, but you have a half ton of pods to do something with, so you go with that. 
The introduction of the Ebon Jaguar in 3049 and the Linebacker in 3052 was basically the beginning of the end of 40 Hellbringer, at least in most frontline units. I wouldn't call either of those 65 Thunder all that great to begin with, but they do fit the role of a medium heavy better than the Hellbringer could and are more built in response to uh, how the Inner Sphere was fighting than the Hellbringer, which is really built for how the clans were fighting. But really, no mech is ever really completely mothballed, and the production of the Elbringer didn't stop, so new configuration did start popping up afterwards with some of the more modern technologies that became available. Delta configuration, as an example, is an infantry and tank killer using four plasma cannons and four tons of foam. You're going to be able to cook things really quickly with that. If you start shooting on mechs with all four of them, though, you're probably going to start wasting ammo. You have to be a little bit careful with plasma weapons because there's only so much external heat that you can breed on a mech that will uh, still register, basically. At closer range, you've got four B-pods, which are very good against battle armor and infantry, but still not the greatest investment of tonnage. You can probably do better with it, probably add some more uh, shooting foam, probably be a better idea. And you get four medium pulse lasers to deal precision damage against art target. Your emotional support in this case is uh, kept with a micro pulse laser that hangs out with you in the head. So you can talk to it while you're shooting at stuff. But uh, once again, it's uh, not terribly great. But it, against infantry, micro pulse lasers do kind of work fairly well. Echo finals in the mobile sniper category using five jump jets to be able to move 150 meters in the air. Your long-range punch is shared between two ER large lasers, giving you decent punch as a raider, and an Hyper Assault Gauss 20 with two tons of reload, which is great at shooting down flyers, and, well, just about everything. The Hyper Assault Gauss 20 is probably my favorite in that range of guns. The larger ones start being a little bit too heavy and don't have enough shots to really be that efficient. The AG-20 gets a very good tonnage-to-damage ratio, in a way. You also have a 10 rack of LRM, giving you some indirect fire options. It's not critical, probably the one thing you could move around if you needed to on that design. Charlie configuration uh, eschews a lot of the long-range offense for a lot of close-range punch. Being fast enough to bring it uh, with a speed of, you know, about 86 kilometers per hour, you should be able to bring it in if you're fighting other heavy mechs. It's not terrible. You get a 20-class LBX autocannon with three tons of reload, which is really decent. You're going to have enough clusters and slugs to last you a while there. While the left side of the kind of concentrates on energy weapons with an ER large laser for your only real long-range direct fire weapon, two ER medium lasers, and a pair of ER small lasers. I'd almost take off those two ER small lasers to add an extra ton of uh, reloads for the LBX, personally. You also have an ATM-6 with uh, three magazines, so you get each of the different type of ammo. But on this particular design, you might want to concentrate on some of the closer range ones, since you're going to get into brawling range. You also have uh, cute little vestigial ands on there, probably uh, closer to what you would see sometimes on a Stormcrow. Getting into fisticuffs with an Elbringer is weird, but you can do it with that design. Here's a bit of a fun one. Foxtrot configuration reminds me of the old Davion Ammerhand battle mech. The Ammerhand is not a thing that you see very often. It has had a uh, comeback in recent years, at least as a stopgap when they were not able to build better mechs. But... Uh, the Foxtrot configuration of the Elbringer is basically a copy of it using a pair of LB-10X autocannon in the arms with an ER medium laser as a coaxial backup. Those are fed by two tons of ammo, which might be a little bit tight, but it is what it is. Each side torso also mounts an extra ER medium laser, and you have a six tube of SRM to exploit holes in the armor that your cluster rounds are not going to exploit already. Maybe a bit superfluous, but you know... It, it's a copy of the Hammerhand with a, maybe a tiny bit less armor. The Hammerhand was not that well armored to begin with. It was slower and could jump. 
So personally, I'd love to make a, a matchup between those two. But uh, buying a hammer hand is not that easy. And the Elbringers we do have around here are kind of earmarked for other things. Golf configuration is an hybrid using some inner sphere technology with an improved heavy Gauss rifle. With the three ton magazine, you get an okay amount of shots, I guess. And improved heavy Gauss rifles do deal a massive amount of damage, but I'm not sure it's the most efficient use of tonnage. You have an improved heavy large laser as well to give you decent punch at shorter range and three ER small lasers in case something gets even closer. This one I am just not sold on. I don't like uh, mixing some of these uh, Inner Sphere techs on Clan Max. There's some stuff that's just available to uh, Inner Sphere uh, powers because the clans never really designed their own thing for them. But for Gauss rifles, I'd probably just have gone with an Hyper Assault Gauss instead. Juliet configuration is usually your jumpy one, and I'm happy they didn't think improved jump jets on this one giving it 150 meters of jump range while it could have gone a lot further by using a massive amount of weight. The arm mount a uh, Ultra AC5 on the left and an ERPBC on the right, or the opposite. I mean, you do you, it's in Omnimech, and you get one full ton of reloads for that Ultra AC5. You get four ER medium lasers in the side torsos, giving you a decent shorter range, and once again, not that much shorter, but shorter range of it and it's supported by a four tube of streak SRMs. For EUR, you do get an anti-missile system and an active probe. Once again, this is a bit of a retread of your prime configuration with things moved around a little bit. And here we see another uh, special body kit for the Hellbringer. This one was used by Clan Jade Falcon uh, fairly recently up until the uh, Battle of Terra. I'm not sure if they're gonna keep using that particular setup. It does look pretty cool and the beaky head is really nice and it's very uh, falcony but once again it's probably not going to be a body kit that is going to sell to anybody outside of clan jade falcon and maybe the snow ravens might buy it because they do like their bird mechs as well who knows tango configuration if you've uh, paid attention seems to be the more modern configuration that are uh, trying to imitate the prime with little modifications this one goes with twin ERPPCs in the arms, and the SRM launcher is replaced with an ATM-6 instead. Not a bad trade. Uh, the triple ER medium lasers are kept, but the machine guns are replaced with AP Gauss rifles, which are much safer to use. Your ammo is kept in a case 2 system, and you actually get extra heat sinks to help out. You basically trade out that electronic warfare ability and those terrible APODs, to make it a little bit tougher and a little bit longer lasting on the field. I do think it's quite efficient as a, a retread of the original, and it's a little bit more focused, which is also a great thing. Another thing people might be paying attention to is that a lot of those clan invasion mechs add retreads or recreations in more recent years with things like uh, the uh, Black Hawk, battle mech rather than omni mech and all those different things being built by the various clans the Elbringer was popular enough that clan jade falcon released their own hell loki mark ii really it is marketed as that in 3121 first off it starts with nine and a half tons of ferrofibrous plate which is a massive upgrade but it is a lot slower with a top speed of 65 kilometers per hour or so it's still not a bad trade for a mech that is going to be uh, using endo steel as well for the chassis, giving you 40 tons of pod space on a 65 ton frame. You can pack a whole lot of weapons, electronic warfare, and gizmos on a mech like that. And this one has been getting more and more popular recently. We will probably have a full video on this one at some point. The Elbringer really did need a refresh, but I'm not sure the L is really what it should have been. I would have preferred uh, it to keep the same kind of speed, even though it would have cut in the pod space of it. Uh, give me an Omnimech with about the same speed profile, more or better armor. I mean, Ferrofibrous is really a much better, especially the clan kind. Move things around a bit, and even if I get a little bit less pod space, I will be quite happy. The chassis of the Elbringer already exists, 
would need to change the gyro pod setup. I mean, it would be a new mech if we were to start doing that. But there is a good basis on the Elbringer and the chassis itself, the frame and the body kits are uh, respectable as well. This is another machine that we uh, more commonly see in second line and suicide units nowadays. But the Elbringer, I assume, will probably still be around for a long time as it is still in production and people are still buying it. So I hope you guys have a very nice rest of your day. I thank you for listening for me for so long and I'll see you guys later. Bye bye.